Dear Pendula, good evening. It's really a pleasure to meet you to talk about uh, your interesting The Lioness Tale. And as first question, we'd like to ask you how Panikar's thought has influenced your work. So, first of all, The, the Lioness Tale is a story that came out of uh, many, many years of working with women in prison, in jail and prison. So how Raimond influenced this work is I was a student of his at UCSB and met him when I was 19 years old, and he changed my life. His way of seeing the world, uh, he really helped broaden and expand my perspective and at the same time gave me a true sense of confidence in myself that as a person I'm not a quantity, I'm a quality, I'm a microcosm, I'm a center of the universe and so I, I can make a difference and so he gave me that kind of co cosmic confidence huh, as a young person and then um, in exploring what I wanted to do and how I wanted to contribute in the world, um, I was involved in a civil disobedience action and I had an opportunity to spend some time in jail. And out of that experience, um, I had this sense of, of real calling towards doing um, prison work in the sense of really exposing what seemed to be me to be a diabolic structure. Diabolic in the sense of fragmenting being. And uh, when I told Ramon that I felt that I'd found uh, my work, he was very, very affirming and said, it's the real work. And how does uh, your book, The Lioness Tale, which is a, a very interesting but curious title, mm -hmm. for example, how uh, can we connect this book uh, to uh, this experience you are talking about? Okay, so I had this experience in jail and I decided that I wanted to work with people in jail. And so I went on and got my master's degree in theology, in liberation theology. And uh, my, my uh, thesis was on envisioning alternatives to incarceration for women. Um, so, got out of school and started doing prison ministry. So out of that uh, work of listening to the stories of women, which is largely a story of abuse, um, really uh, many of these women that I listened to were raised in the foster care system. Mm -hmm. So so I heard a story of, of woundedness, of abuse, of uh, abandonment, um, of being that would represent their experience. So this is an allegory. And it's an allegory about a young lioness captured in her youth and forced to live out her life in captivity. But it's a story that's has a bigger framework than just the story of suffering, because we situate it in, in the bigger picture of our basic human goodness. Huh? And uh, uh, do you use a special method, or which uh, type of method does uh, inspire mm -hmm. your uh, way of uh, working with these people? Well, first of all, the book. The book really speaks to their experience. And one of the things I wanted to do is uh, to, I work with women who are doing life prison sentences. Some will get out eventually, some will never get out of prison. So I wanted to see if the book would really speak to them. So in a certain way, it was an experiment on my part. Will this book speak to their experience. And they tell me that it's right on. They say it's spot on. They say, I don't understand how you wrote this book having not done life in prison yourself. 
so to enter into it and begin to touch areas of their lives that maybe they've never had support for in connecting with. And they begin to grieve and they begin to feel their, their sadness and their loss and their abandonment and basically the wound that is right there on top of the obstruction really of their essential nature, knowing their own goodness. So by going back gently, not too quickly, but the story helps them move towards going through those layers of defense that keep obstruct us from our basic goodness. Uh, the story helps them move toward or a person in, in the this is all done in group. So I choose twelve women. I start with twelve women who are doing these life sentences. Um, we read the story together. So the first we have an eight hour workshop and we begin with essence. We begin with basic goodness, experiences of basic goodness. I introduce the Enneagram of Personality. I introduce uh, a basic observation practice, which is a ba basic meditation practice. Um, we do also some guided visualizations around um, basic, our basic goodness. And the other thing that we use is collage, which is you know tearing uh, images, words from magazines. So. We also have a, a time in that first workshop where they're just really kind of beginning to immerse themselves in the possibility that underneath, before the wounding, uh, before the betrayal, before the abandonment, before, before the alienation, that there was something prior that they can reconnect with. Working. So uh, I'm working in a maximum security prison in California. It's the largest women's prison in the world. I see. And uh, you, what are your projects in this sense? Uh, you think that uh, you can apply this method in other countries, for example? Well, the method is, first of all, to find, I go in and I find the women who are doing these long sentences. So to give them a sense of meaning and purpose for their life and find, to take them through these introductory workshops and find the ones who want to continue and become mentors, what we say in the book, Panthers. The Panther is the character in the book that embodies the transformational energies. Okay, So those women who want to be Panthers and lead their own groups throughout the prison. So the point is, is to empower a core community that's lit up from the inside, who's connected with their own freedom, and have found that that, the, that they are bigger than their circumstances, and to begin to teach the program in the prison. So, what we're trying to do at CCWF is to make the program sustainable and really give it roots there um, and successful so it can be duplicated in other prisons. So the next step is to take the women who've just finished that part of the program, that mentoring part of the program, after 18 months of work with me. Um, we're going to be writing a workbook together, so there will be a workbook to go with the book that will be co-written by the women and be, have their stories of transformation embedded in the, the workbook. And then the, the step after that then would be for me to train people to do what I do. Okay, we uh, thank you very much for your interesting uh, conversation and uh, our wishes for your uh, project uh, for the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Me this time. Okay, uh, rely on the stage. Jak się wadę Bonker, Diana has told us of a special project. Now we would like you to tell us something about your Harvest Skyline Harvest Center, of which you are one of the members of the directors. Yes. 
Yes, well, the center is in the mountains in Northern California. Diane and I were old friends from the days of studying with Panikkar. And when she wanted to start, she's always known she wanted to have a community and a center based on Panikkar's thoughts on this property that she has in Northern California. And so when she finally came to the crystallization of what that center was going to focus on, embodying in some way Raymond Panikkar's cosmosyandric vision and with that complete devotion to this, the idea that the cosmosyandric vision must include us all. So she wanted to have an outreach and that was the lit up program, the work in the prisons. But at the center itself, it's got a part where she wants to have more connection to the earth in terms of having agricultural activities there. That's the, we have a alternative agriculture, sustainable agriculture. The other part is the Echo Sophia element where we have an earth liturgy once a month where we have a small community of people who share a liturgy which once again is very open in the Panikarian sense of multicultural inter-religious dialogue and with that earth again as a spiritual part. And um, what would you tell us about your future programs? Well, as I said, the developing part of the program is more sustainable alternative agriculture activities. And there have been several people. The other one is the Panikkar Library. So my husband, Roger Rapp, was also a student of Panikkar's and spent the last five years of Ramon's life, and as it turned out, my husband's life also, in Spain, and he had the idea, Roger had the idea, of having a Panikkar library at Skyline on, in, in the United States, where... Uh, going back to your library project, it, it is going on? It has started. Certainly, Ramon Panikkar gave us many, many books during the time that my husband was going back and forth from Spain. So Panikkar was always sending books back with us, articles, manuscripts. So yes, we have many of those and we've started organizing and cataloging them. Yes. Yeah, she, uh, we really thank you for the interview and we wish you a good work in California. Thank Hoping you. to meet you.